Okay, I, I think this is on. Thank you. Now tonight, not everything's going to be on a slide, so I have to do a bit of old-fashioned listening if you want to um, hear all that I've got to say. Eight years after commencing practice, a young engineer was facing court action. It involved some flats that he had designed. The foundations of those flats involved some board piles supporting concrete floor and concrete block, the two flats. The flats suffered some structural and settlement damage. The engineer's insurer decided to defend on the basis that the engineer hadn't been engaged to carry out observation, as it was known then. The court held the engineer liable on the grounds that the design was not complete and to the building structure had been built. That engineer was me. I learnt a couple of very powerful lessons from that. First, never do a foundation design unless you're satisfied that comprehensive and deep soils investigations have been carried out. Said to report with just the process of reviewing a job where engineers fall into the same trap. Shallow investigations, and I notice certainly in the Waikato area, a lot of people are only doing hand auger boreholes, and this is especially dangerous when they're near part of the old gully system. So uh, there's going to be a bit of embarrassment coming for someone on that. The other thing that I've always insisted on since then is to insist on carrying out construction monitoring or observation, as it was known then. And I've made what used to be uh, a design certificates conditional upon us doing construction monitoring, and of course, latterly, on the PS4s. So there's a painful, costly, financially and emotionally, that is, but a very powerful learning. And this is the first time we've actually shared that in public. There's a saying that a smart person learns from their mistakes, but a wise person learns from mistakes made by others. Now, I'm here tonight because I gave a brief talk at the CSOC conference in August uh, on the lightning talk session, and Mia's asked me to expand on that, and uh, uh, thank you for your attendance and interest. I'm not a specialist engineer, uh, but I've had a wee bit of experience. Initially started off in practice in Hamilton, and more recently at an office in Auckland. In general practice, mainly doing structural work in Auckland, but general civil and structural in Hamilton. Now, notwithstanding what your insurers will tell you, Sometimes there are advantages in admitting a mistake promptly, especially if the likely costs are less than your insurance excess. Now, I've done this on a couple of occasions. Each time, a favourable reaction from the client. In fact, in one case, I made a mistake on some precast stairs. I actually put half the reinforcing in them they should have, so obviously they cracked. So I paid, admitted it, paid for the mistake, and I've continued to act for that firm over the last 30 years with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of fees and an ex excellent relationship. So I think there is something to be said to admitting mistakes, and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. So just a bit about me and why I'm here. I've carried out quite a lot of reviews in the last few years, more than 50 on buildings and structures. Some of them are detailed, uh, some were for expert evidence, for IPEN's disciplinary proceedings, others high-level reviews, some subsequently reviewed by Holmes and others. Some were as a result of a low seismic uh, rating on ISA. One arose from evidence provided was I was a practice area assessor for a CP Eng. He put this building up as a work sample and alarm bells rang and that's taken some time to resolve. Also get involved in uh, designing retrofit design attachments for large retail stores and uh, putting cranes into existing buildings. And um, another review was a result of a partial collapse of that uh, transmission tower, uh, communication tower, which we'll come to later. Sadly, more than half of the structures that I've reviewed have had multiple significant and serious mistakes. Many of the mistakes are the same or similar, even though They've been designed by different engineers and from different firms. Despite a comments made 
by some people in Engineering New Zealand and implied in a recent paper in the CSOP journal. Uh, none were for engineers from small or sole practice, apart from ones I make. All were engineers in mid-sized and larger practices, including at least one from a multinational firm. These reviews were all carried out in a, a period where structural engineers had in the spotlight. Uh, John Scarry's open letter in the early 2000s led to an IPENS inquiry in 2003. We had the Southland Stadium collapse and a subsequent inquiry, collapse of some buildings and South Island snowstorms, Canterbury Earthquake, Royal Commission, CTV building and the like, some issues around Masterton buildings. More recently, the fallout from the Kaikoura earthquake, Statistics House and others. Of course, there's been anecdotal evidence, and I can't substantiate that there have been issues in some of these other buildings, Waitakere Stadium, Victor Arena, Chartwell Shopping Centre. There have been a couple of um, IPENs, Engineering New Zealand disciplinary cases uh, involving a couple of buildings, and just recently has reported problems with a building at 230 High Street in Christchurch, which I understand MB are currently looking at. So tonight I've sort of divided it into uh, several sections. I'll see if I can learn how to drive this thing. Ah, good. Um, up there has got Professor Reason has developed what's known as the Swiss cheese model. See, on one side you've got the hazards, on the other side accident and losses. And the idea is that there can be a number of other slices, if you like, with holes. Some are latent conditions and some are known mistakes. Now, obviously, for us in structural engineering, there'd be more than just two intermediate layers. But when those all line up, the holes all line up, and you have an accident or a loss. For us, that's most likely going to occur in a decent seismic event or a severe storm. So most of the mistakes I've found were on low-rise buildings, typically portal frame, concrete tilt panel, but not all. Most of them are quite new, within 10 years old. In fact, one didn't even have a PS4 issue that was that new. So some of these buildings are, are still subject to confidentiality agreements and litigation, I've tried to keep the descriptions brief and the buildings anonymous. In the design of most of these buildings, it surprised me that they already had some sort of a review. Most had PS2s, some of which were internal, in other words, from engineers in the same firm. One at least had what I'd call a tame reviewer reviewing it, and uh, some had high-level reviews and from some big name firms um, that were part of the consenting process, but they've all missed these issues. So I'll start off just going through uh, some of them. First one, starting from the ground up, soil types. Uh, at least two of the samples, the engineer had used incorrect soils type class for their um, seismic design. They used class C instead of D. Now, if you're going to do work in a different area that you're not familiar with, it pays to get hold of a local engineer or the local geotech people, uh, especially on sites with alluvial soils where those soil types are pretty important. I've also found that this area is quite common with initial seismic assessments, especially from engineers from out of town. Another one not so frequent, but at least on three or four occasions, incorrect important level. Medical Centre was meant to be designed for IL-3. We had a look at it. It wasn't even adequate for IL-2 actions. Communication Tower, it appears, was designed for about IL-1.5, notwithstanding that it had police communication antenna, microwaves, cell phones, radio, TV antenna on it. Should have been IL-4. The next one was just about universal on all of them is the ductility assumed in design is not matched by detailing. This is probably the most common mistake. The designer gaily goes along, say, for a portal, use ductility three, it comes to draw it, there's little or no restraints, or they're poorly positioned or inadequate. 
past design. Now, I know there's been a bit of discussion about when that should be applied, but I think MB Determination 2013, number 57, clarifies the intention of that section 8 of 1175. Wall panels, for example, in a portal frame building, spanning vertically or horizontally, be designed for part actions, as are the connections to the portal frames and any upper level horizontal beam, but not the portal frames themselves. And this has been a very frequent error. Load paths, I'm going to talk about that several times, but incomplete load paths, especially for lateral resisting elements, are very common. Lack of consideration of building eccentricities. Now this building is a old retail shopping centre. The designers had not considered building eccentricity. Sometimes, of course, it would be worthwhile to isolate them, but in this case, when it came to retrofit, the engineers elected to do a fancy ETABS analysis and designed retrofit remediation works. Precast concrete wall supports, or the lack of them. Now this building up here is up to 10 metres high. You can see the dotted lines there are the retrofit required to provide lateral support for those walls. This building had been designed PS1, PS2 and consented. Another one, building completed, and on the left hand side, no roof or lateral wall supports for the upper part of those panels. Again, that's a, a, a recently constructed building. Foundations. You seem to come to grief on many of the buildings I've looked at and foundations. Now the detail here, the lighter one, is the original design, tilt panel wall, lower footing tied into the slab, and we came to review that, and the review was reviewed by other engineers as well as myself, found that the foundation detail was inadequate for both in and out of plane actions. So you can see by the extent of the remediation work uh, that they got it quite wrong. Cast and inserts. Suppose three quarters of the buildings had details like this, with either a single or double layer of inserts and reinforcing. University of Auckland research three, four years ago published their findings. They established that the inserts gave a very low performance. They ran a whole lot of testing. And you can see on the right-hand side a strut and tie model explaining why. I was rather surprised, acting as a practice area assessor just uh, last month, that I had two applications to review, and both of them presented foundations of this nature, despite the publicity given to the problems with it. Now this picture is a bit incomplete, um, I couldn't find the, the right detail, but this shows portal frame bolted down to a uh, board pile, about 600 diameter by 2 metres long, and that assumed base fixity. Problems were the bolts didn't have enough development length, and they hadn't considered the, the flexure of the base plate and the movement from that, or the soil footing interaction. Obviously that would depend very much on the, the soils and will vary from site to site. Extremely common one, I've seen this from about six or seven different firms, that detail. And it may well have been copied from an earlier paper presented by someone I think from uh, MB about many years ago. But 
the application, the people have been designing these assuming restraint. The connection to the portals is just a simple web plate bolted connection. You can see here as the wall pulls away, there'll be prying action on the bolt. Most of them are post-installed, some are um, pre-installed fasteners. You can see there's no effective restraint from the outstanding flange. And none of them have been designed for actions according to parts. So roof and wall bracing, problems with them. Engineers using ductility on them, but forgetting about the CS factor. And also it's common for reed bracing to be designed with some ductility, even in recent jobs where reeds state that they should be designed elastically. Some cases, they were just incomplete. A couple of examples of eccentricities. The photos aren't that good. Hopefully you can make it out. The brace connected at a knee portal outside of the face of the portal. You can't actually just see the portal leg. This one is the classic. A couple of things wrong. Obviously the eccentricity, but also the strut is designed or has, has an eccentric connection that was not considered in design. Now, a favourite of mine. And then within about eight years ago, our knee joints were diagonal stiffeners. Now, way back when I was at Ardmore, we were taught a method to, um, to analyze these, and over the years I've tried to make them work and not had much luck. Now, here's a, a building. You've got a decent sized portal, uh, no sign of uh, knee bra uh, fly braces or restraints. Just a single 16 mil stiffener, and it just doesn't work. I've um, done, and thanks to um, Michelle Grant and John Scarry, um, a very simple calculation just using overstrength of the flanges, working out what those forces are, resolving into the stiffener, looking at the stiffener capacity, and in this particular case, I reckon that the capacity was about 684 but the demand was 1,089. Um, so obviously retrofit is required. Another wall, precast wall curling connection. Again, I see this very commonly. And I must concede this is one I've made myself, a mistake I've made myself. So a lot of engineers are relying on the purlins to transfer loads and compression and tension back to a bracing system further along the building. But you can see quite simply that as the wall goes out, it's going to be prying actions on those fasteners. And uh, here we've got some two bolts, non-seismic rated, and they're just going to uh, fail. So that's very similar on end walls for portal frame, uh, sorry, the um, tilt panel portal frame buildings and in internal walls. Uh, said I was going to come back to this one. Communication tower partial collapse. I got a call about 18 months ago after a storm to come out and have a look at this. What was an almost 60 meter high communication tower, the top part from level 34 above was this mess on the ground. My first impression going there was, look at those bolts on that flange. They look tiny. They look very widely spaced. And analysis, of course, um, proved that to be the case. This is one of those communication towers that is, well, meant to be designed for IL one and a half, but I don't think the storm we had was even an IL one storm, and it failed failed by the bolts, which were only 4.6, failing, and then the whole the upper part collapsed. It was quite interesting one for me, and it's slightly digressing. Uh, we were asked to report on that, 
dripping with the police involved, it was heavily peer reviewed, and then we were engaged to investigate and do the strengthening. So the original standing part of the tower had pre-stressed round anchors down into the bedrock. Uh, so we had them tested. Uh, we've looked at testing the bolts. So we've then had to design it with a little bit of strengthening of the foundations. Luckily, the original foundation design was pretty conservative. Um, otherwise, we probably had to reconstruct the whole tower. But we've had to strengthen all the flange joints, and they're jointed about every eight metres. And all the bolts originally used were 4.6. Um, so we've had to um, put additional bolts in, uh, stiffeners, and in some cases, with the flanges, usually uh, we use the method, um, the HERA method, that um, uh, for these sort of things, um, we had to end up using effectively really heavy washers um, to be able to make it to work. One that only I've only come across a couple of times, but I suspect is more widespread. Spread, particularly, I must confess that I'm not always. Uh, complied, and that is local wind pressures. Now, my practice has normally been to be pretty conservative on the selection of them, and for the reviews done, um, I kind of escaped, but it's something that I give a lot more thought to now than I had previously. In this particular case, this was the building that didn't even have the PS4, um, had to retrofit with the um, DHS, the 150 DS. DHS run along the bottom uh, for the affected parts. Another one we found only in, in one job was a single story office building where they had, I think, three cantilever concrete precast walls. They were with, fixed with um, dross back connections. Uh, they had so heavily reinforced them that the concrete uh, was risking a brittle failure mode. Of course, those sort of walls are vulnerable to seismic actions both in and out of plane and concurrently. And this is one of those incomplete bracing. Now, I just described the building. The, um, the part on your left is a gable. Part on the right is a lean-to, but at a different level. So there's a um, concrete wall at the base of the drawing and on the uh, left-hand side. So the question was, well, where did the loads from that brace, that, that pair of braces as highlighted in blue, go? And then quite a common one was no bracing on canopies. And also on this one, no consideration of building eccentricities. Uh, another case was only one of these that I've found so far. This is out of plane action for um, cantilevered block walls on the boundary. Again, not using uh, parts provision. Um, then moving on to diaphragm design, and I'm no expert on that. There are people in the audience that know far more than me, but I did attend the recent Strut and Tie uh, seminar, and uh, there's some useful tools on how to design diaphragms. And I think diaphragm design has been a bit of a poor cousin and hasn't been properly. Um, done, and I think the CTV building and subsequent events just highlight how vulnerable they can be if they've not done properly. Now, one of mine, this is an older one, I designed a farm bridge in the King Country, it was in 1980, a long, long time ago, and I designed cylindrical piles, it was in sort of a papa rock, and a steel superstructure. And I think naively, um, I hadn't really seriously considered the flood damage. So about five years after it was built, decent flood comes along, lots of timber and damage, and the, the pier and the, um, the pile moved over a bit. So that was one of those cases where um, uh, it was best for me to pay up um, and get it fixed. Another little one, although it could, be, could have had significant effect, just a couple of years ago, I was designing a two-level storage building and calculating my seismic loads. And I just used the one I'd been used to of 0.4 for the reduction factor, of course, instead of the 0.6. Um, so if you're doing a storage building, just be aware of that. Uh, another 
one. Uh, this is a um, portal frame over a um, agricultural showroom. And you can see that the outer portal frames have got legs, but the middle one, the architect wanted to put a door there. So they put a beam and a couple of posts in, plus the horizontal beam, which I haven't highlighted. Come to build it, and no surprise, or shouldn't have been a surprise to me, um, the portal frame over the doors displaced um, rather more than the others. Luckily, that was found out during construction and was fairly easily fixed to, to brace it back. But I think that we don't give, always give enough consideration to what displacements do, and especially displacements from different parts of the building close to each other. Portal frame restraints. This is uh, one of those that Bolt Shopping Centre I talked to earlier, and this is only a very small part of it. Uh, you may not be able to make out the green where the um, additional fly braces are required on the braced frames, but they're also required on the portal legs. And that seems to be an area a lot of engineers ignore. They might happily put in fly braces on the raft, but you still need to have restraint on the portal legs, and obviously depends on the height of that leg. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time on a, uh, two buildings that we did a detailed assessment for. Uh, the building on the, um, that I've called B was built first, and uh, the building to the right, which also featured with the roof bracing, uh, was built in about 2010. So I'll just highlight a number of mistakes that we found. Firstly, when calculating seismic loads, the designer had used a KMU of 2.25 instead of what should have been 1.25. Again, selected ductility 3, but failed to follow through on the detailing. The wall transom, or the upper beam, not designed for parts, not designed for restraints. And we assessed, depending on the span, that was going to be coming in like something like 15 to 55 percent of what it should have been. Steel portal frames, not enough fly braces or um, resistance to buckling. Uh, the plates on the floor were similar to that one that I described before. Same fixity, um, but the base plate bolts. Uh, not enough embedment. It was a non-compact section and the consideration that are needed were not considered. So we figured that the strength of those frames varied from 26 to 60 percent. This is a building you know, not even 10 years old and when we did this, which was a couple of years ago, it was quite new. The concrete wall panels weren't adequately connected to the foundations and they'd used those insert um, things and the footing sizes weren't adequate either. And this we estimated the strength was around 12 to 40 percent of what it should have been. The roof bracing I've already talked about. Wall panel stability, I, well, I've just talked about that too. And then the interaction with the adjoining building. Got in blue there the concrete walls. So there's no consideration of what would be happening to that building. Uh, you've got the portal frames in opposite directions, sure. There's a pretty flexible roof diaphragm, um, but that hasn't really been considered in the um, calculations. There was a mezzanine floor there, shaded yellow. We couldn't find any calculations or design on them and how it affected the building. And the canopies didn't have any bracing. The eccentricities of the building due to its planned shape and structure weren't considered. Displacement compatibility, again, not considered, and you sort of got to think, well, what would happen in a real earthquake? Obviously, the roof's going to do a bit of bracing, but I think there's going to be a lot of damage. And load paths on the, on the roof. So if you look at the building B, which is was the, the building first in 2006. It's a C-shape, really, with walls at each end, walls at the back, four frames going across, open, um, on, the, on the side with doors, same sort of things, ductility three, horizontal whaler beams, 
uh, not designed for parts and inadequate. Portal frames were okay, but the deflection was way beyond what they should have been. Uh, roof bracing, again, given so the... What was that deflection? You said it was way beyond. How much beyond? Or what was the deflection criteria that was Oh, well, they're just using the guidelines out of um, 11, uh, 1170. Say again? Yeah, more flexible, yes. Uh, the roof bracing again, incomplete really given the shape and the eccentricities of the building. And again, um, the, uh, they used double purlins and hollow sections for struts and hadn't considered the eccentricities. Uh, and we figured that that reduced the capacity to about 60%. Wall panel, the same as the other one, not properly tied down, out of plane action, uh, inadequate, and of course they use the red inserts. And in fairness to some of these guys here, the publicity and the information on the use of red inserts wasn't really available until the last you know, four years or so. Interaction with the adjoining building, we've talked about that. Another mezzanine floor, but this time designed for jib bracing. You've got to wonder about what happens with the relatively flexible portal frames and, and walls and, and, and the um, jib bracing. And I think that's a fairly common problem that we see in reviewing structures. Eccentricities not considered in displacement compatibility. So both these, built, these buildings came in something like 30, 34% of what should have been. These were both reviewed. Um, homes did a high level review, just earthquake only and they came up with similar numbers. Sorry, I should have showed that one before. So why and how are these mistakes being made? It's probably a lot of reasons, but some of the ones that I think contribute, first off, and these aren't in a particular order, rushing jobs, rushing to get a job out to meet a deadline or skimping get it, to get it out within budget. Inadequate QA, an internal review. It's often, of course, compromised by rushing. And I've detected a trend for people to adopt a tick box approach rather than really thinking about what's going on with the structure. Now, I personally, and I'm probably a bit of a dinosaur, uh, brought up on doing stuff by hand but I have noticed for myself, using computers and spreadsheets, I've lost a lot of the feeling for structures that I used to have. It was developed by doing really tedious hand counts, such as moment distribution. Um, and I think that we need to um, somehow regain that feeling for what the structure is doing. I remember Professor Mowbray, when I was at Ardmore, uh, displaying this sort of feeling thing and perhaps what would now be called quite obscene fashion, but it was certainly memorable as far as I was concerned. Another big one, adopting standard details and practices without critical thought. Copying them from internally or externally, and most of the repeated mistakes that I've seen are likely to be in this category. For example, the standard portal knee joint stiffeners, the footing details, the pillar to wall details, the way to transfer connections and restraints. Fees. Now, I remember John uh, Scarry talking about that, and it's something I have to agree with. When I commenced work for an industrial building, the fees were, and we had a scale fee in those days, 7.5%. Uh, 80% of which was for the design, 20% for observation. Now, I've heard stories that people are doing design for fees less than 2%. Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> now, training and mentoring. I think that that is possibly a contributing factor. So, um, I, th I think that what used to happen in the Ministry of Works days, and with the consultants. I never worked for the Ministry of Works, but I worked for a, la a firm of large consultants. Um, we had a lot of training, a lot of mentoring, 
And I know some firms try to do that, but overall, I don't know if we're doing that well enough. Another one, and perhaps hesitate to really say this, but sadly, I think it's true, the arrogance and attitude of some engineers. You know, in two cases, on two of these buildings, the engineers concerned were in denial for a period of longer than two years. In fact, in one example, we were in a um, judicial conference uh, settlement meeting. The engineer plus the engineer from his insurers and his barristers got really aggressive. They were threatening me. They were going to sue me and take me down. Um, <laughs> subsequently, um, it was the agreement for that was to be reviewed by another reputable firm, and the designers had to back down. And certainly on the quantum, uh, sorry, on the um, substance, but not the quantum. And we had a date scheduled for November last year in Wellington. And um, I arrived to see my client and the lawyer smiling. I thought, uh -uh. So they settled on the doorsteps for some, you know, not far short of a couple of mil. So we're going to learn from mistakes. There's some prerequisites, the experts say. It makes common sense. First of all, we have to know about the mistake. We've got to understand the mistake. And then the crunch one is we're wanting to change behavior, owning the mistake, be it one of our own or from others. Cross. So is, how many people have heard of Cross? You know, I would have hoped for an audience of structural engineers who would have been more. Confidential reporting of structure safety. It was an initiative initially from the UK, sponsored by ICE and ICE, and now extended a year ago to Australasia, and just in, now announced to the USA. Cross is based on a no-blame reporting of structural mistakes, reportedly following a practice initiated by NASA and widely used in the aviation sector. And I know that well because I had 40 odd years of flying small aircraft, some of it commercially. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the safety record of aviation is improving. But anyway, Cross publishes a regular newsletter. Sometimes extracts of these are published in the CSOC journal. So if you're not already a subscriber, sign up now. Improving our QA. I don't know if this needs to be a big, complex system, you know, ISO, whatever it is, uh, procedure. All I do is I keep lists, which are several pages long, divided into the various sections of the structure. And every mistake that I've made, that I've seen, there's a quick checklist just to go through. But before you can do that, you have to understand the structure you're reviewing. And that means spending a little bit of time on it. Um, but I think, for me, that is an effective way of quality assurance. So I think one of the key marks of professionalism is to share, which includes sharing information on mistakes. Share information on our own mistakes. That can be hard. And I've alluded to that tonight, how hard it was for me to share the opening um, description. Share mistakes that you come across, including those found in either regulatory or uh, peer reviews. So how can we do that? Well, first off, obviously starting in your workplace, formally or informally. Share in discussion groups. If you don't belong to one, establish one. Now, I belong to a group in the Waikato, going for about 30 years. We've had monthly meetings with about 10 of us attend. Um, and that has been really worthwhile. And uh, recently, maybe the last 12 years or so, the Rodney Group was formed. They meet monthly on the first Friday of the month for morning tea. And again, that's, that group has quite significant numbers. In fact, was the genesis of the recently established general practice engineer ring uh, SIG group. 
If you're game enough, share with your structural group like I am tonight. You could write a brief item for the CSOC journal. I know Stuart Hobbs would welcome any along the lines I learned from that. Doesn't need to be a very long, just a paragraph long. You could contribute to the CSOC online forum. Uh, some people seem to participate, but I would have hoped there would be a wider participation in that. And I think if we can promote a just culture in your workplace, a just culture, a no-blame reporting of mistakes and incidents. Obviously, if there's something blatant, you know, disregard for the rules, uh, then you know, that's a different story. Um, but I think if you can do that in your workshop through Engineering New Zealand, and CSOP, uh, that will improve because unless we know about these things, uh, we're doomed to do what's happened before, repeat the mistakes of, of, that others have already made. And I could also suggest that before you sign or agree a confidentiality agreement, you make sure there's a provision in there to share the mistakes and the learnings from them in an anonymized basis. So if you do peer reviews, share it. Now, there was an article, um, presentation at the CSOC conference by Stanley Chung from WSP Opus titled Trends and Observations from Regulatory Reviews in Wellington. And that will be shortly published as part of the conference proceedings. But I think I and most of the audience were appalled to hear the extent of abuse that that reviewer had to put up with. And I hope that none of us are guilty of that sort of behaviour. I think that it's a mark of professionalism that we welcome a review. We might not welcome, sometimes they're a damn nuisance, um, but you treat the reviewing engineer with respect. And I think in terms of sharing, I think um, Holmes Group from Hamilton uh, set a good example, and they did a presentation to Waikato Structural Group on stuff they had learned doing reviews for the Hamilton City Council. I also understand that a lot of the firms, probably the bigger firms, run in-house sessions, including learning from mistakes. But I also hear that some of those have been withdrawn or ceased because of issues around blame. So I think if we can get this just culture established, that will help. So I hope that this session has provided an opportunity to learn from some mistakes and never to repeat any of the mistakes described above. Now this is not the end. Um, so sharing information, and now I'm going to share with you some learnings that were found by the HFC group in doing some peer reviews. Now I'm not the expert, but I'll do my best uh, to cover those. I need a bit of technical assistance here. Yeah. So what we get, what this is covers, covers some design items that almost always seem to be done incorrectly or forgotten altogether so that we can avoid making the same mistakes. And you'll see a bit of interesting detail here. In no particular order. Have a look at this joint. How many things do you think are possibly wrong with this connection? Portal frame, designed for ductility of three. We figure there's about five, you might find more. The stiffness might be underside based on the actual size of the beam, given it's a generic detail and subject to overstrength. Misalignment of flanges and stiffness, load path, load path again. You might need some panel zone reinforcing given that the overstrength plastic hinge is forming on the column face. The fillet weld to the web, <coughs> excuse me, might be undersized at six to achieve full capacity of the web depending on the thickness. No welding details, could be others. Panel zone detailing always seems to be neglected according to the writer. So he asks a couple of questions. What if we had a beam framing into a column of the same size? How many of the standard UBs would not require a doublet plate if your moment was, say, 80%? None. Likewise, UCs, moment 
This means that you almost always need panel zone reinforcement and moment resisting frames, even at a duct relief one. That's unless your column size is two or three sizes up. For a ductility of 1.25 or higher, uh, connections and the columns need to be designed for capacity design actions, full overstrength of the beam, unless limited by the upper design limits. So there are the um, highlighted uh, some of those issues. Final detail bit of it's still wrong, noting that the upper stiffener um, goes right through the web. What question of modification of standard details, either standard here at SCNZ, WP40s. On the upper two, there are 8 mil plate, the lower two, uh, 10 plate, 10 mm plate. So you can see the capacities uh, might not be what you expect. So if you're modifying standard details, don't design by guesstimation without evaluating the effects of the change. Thinking more bolts always means more capacity? No. Thinking thicker plates means more capacity? No. Thinking higher grade plates means more capacity. You'll see in some cases, you will in some cases invalidate some of the governing criteria in a connection model. For example, for more bolts, you might even be, not be governed by bolt capacity in the first place. For thicker or stronger plates, you may force the bolts to become a critical failure mechanism, potentially a brittle failure if overloaded. So a good example of this is modifying a standard MEP type connection. We are trying to avoid a mode 3 failure of a ductile. So how to avoid issues? Firstly, don't modify them unless you really have to. Check and design any modifications, especially if you're pushing the capacity to the max and or the connection is part of a primary lateral load resisting system and or you're relying on plate bending. Understand the implications of changing various parameters. Be familiar with the design models. It's always good to work out the capacity by hand once or twice to understand the design model. Get a feel for what you're doing and always design to the minimum design actions from 3404 to impart a minimum degree of robustness for the connections. So a couple of things to remember. Here are web plate connections are designed for grade 250 plate, where the web and plate are less than 9 mil. The threads are excluded cases assumed. Typically beams less than 460 UB only have an 8 plate. Simply changing from 8 to 10 can result in less capacities. Welding for weld plates is designed to yield the cleat before failure of the welds. Increasing the thickness or capacity of the plate can easily invalidate that assumption. Here are tension compression splices are detailed for end bearing and grade 250 plates. Introducing a gap for some construction tolerances invalidates the design module, uh, model. So often we see fabricators trying to use grade 300 Question, what's the yield strength of 8 mil grade 300 plate? Not as you'd first suspect, 300 is actually 320. You can see that out of um, the code. And it's different again for hot roll sections. So always use the correct yield strength and thickness. And this is a thing that this reviewer is seen all the time in calculations. And be aware that grade XXX doesn't mean yield stress is equal to XXX. You make a difference, especially when dealing with overstrength, forces or connections capacities, and for composite design. Angle design. So what's the plate thickness of a leg of 100 by 100 by 10 equal angle? Yeah, nine and a half mil. So knowing that, what do you reckon it is for 100 by 100 by 6? Just to trick you, it's six. For angle designs, be wary of using the ASI capacity tables. He asks the question for a one metre long, 100 by 10 equal angle, what's the capacity? Here we've highlighted 397 to 481, neither, it's actually 183. Why? The Aussie tables are based on the Aussie codes, not New Zealand. The New Zealand code treats the design of angles differently. New Zealand Code also 
um, treats it differently for the Aussie uh, tables and can't be used for the shear capacities of RHSs and SHSs. So the design uh, is based on slenderness ratios determined for different connection configurations for slender angles. It's based on combined actions check, taking into account the moment for the eccentricities at the end for stocking angles. That requirement's hidden away in the combined action check of the steel code and isn't referenced in the compression section. So it's always, almost always overlooked. Member restraints, this is a fairly big one. It seems to be consistently poorly applied for both flexion and compression. What's assumed to be a mistake, a restraint, doesn't qualify. So going back to first principles, it's all about demonstrating that you have a restraint that is stiff enough to prevent lateral displacement of the critical flange and flexure, or the entire section if it's a compression member. Some definitions in 3404, should be familiar with those. The code requires approaches that the design of restraints for a lateral load equal to 2.5% of the force in the element. For flexure, the critical flange is usually the compression flange, but not always. For compression members, both flanges are critical flanges. So the approach in 304 is that for a practical brace arrangements that meet the strength requirement, that stiffness is implied, but it's not specifically talked about. Unfortunately, this leads to the anomaly that while the strength may be okay, the stiffness falls short, which a lot of people don't appreciate. The strength requirement there actually means stiffness and strength. The older codes had a stiffness requirement, but it was removed for the above reason about practical braces. Now, if you've assumed a certain type of restraint in your design, you better be able to prove it and detail it so that we should all know about the buckling of um, compression members. So people are often relying on restraints with no effective load path for the restraint force. Classic example they see often, Perlin's magically providing natural restraint to beams in designing the beams for a segment length equal to the Perlin's facing. Just adding a fly base doesn't necessarily constitute a restraint if there's no load path provided. Reliance on lean to bracing systems without meeting stiffness requirements to force higher modes of buckling behavior for example, using an adjacent beam to resist the restraint loads. This can work, but only when the adjacent member is approximately 20 or 30 times the minor atlas stiffness of the beam being braced. Or simply just assuming restraints and calcs, but not detailing, as I mentioned before. Another thing that people miss is neglecting the accumulation of restraint forces 2.5% plus 1.25% from six adjacent members. Also, neglecting restraints within ends and that the region and the ends and of yielding regions. This is all in the code. Designing restraints for forces directly out of analysis, which can lead to problems. Now they provide an example here. This is a, a bracing plan, the original submitted for consent. A bit hard to really um, see the differences. You may see the clouded areas, particularly around the, the, the um, bracing bays, um, where there have been changes required after the third attempt. So they say concept is the king. Having a good concept goes a long way to simplifying design and arriving at an economic solution that's easy to construct and avoids poor, potentially poor systems and decisions. For many structures, a flawed concept or interpretation of the design requirements at an early stage can have significant implications at later design stages. Another building, original consent. Notice the row of bracing, the lower of the first floor level, and then final consent drawing six months later. That bracing's gone, there's a bit more upstairs. Portal frame, as submitted, constant section UB, second go at it, big haunches at the knees, and some additional plates on the columns. The final one, substantial haunches, still the plates um, on the columns 
poorly conceived from the start. So again, they make a plea, and I've mentioned it earlier, load path, load path, load path. Always consider the effects of eccentricities and load paths. Small eccentricities can result in disproportionate reductions in capacity. Remember that the design level earthquake is just that, an arbitrary level of load that's determined based on probabilities of risk. So be mindful that a real earthquake doesn't read the code. And also make sure that your structure at ULS has sufficient robustness to prevent collapse for these large earthquakes. That means good load paths. I won't go on to that one, so that is pretty much it for me. Thank you.